Hi, I'm Peter Adamson, and you're listening to the History of Philosophy podcast, brought to you with the support of the Philosophy Department at King's College London and the LMU in Munich, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Once and for All, SCOTUS on Being. We began our tour through the world of 13th century philosophy by citing a classic philosophical remark, it depends upon what the meaning of the word is, is. Those who recall the political debates of the 1990s will have no trouble identifying this as a quote from Bill Clinton. But historians of philosophy might rather think of a far earlier debate. Among medievals, there was a heated controversy over the meaning of is. Does being, in Latin esse, have only one meaning or many different meanings? Usually, we have no difficulty answering this sort of question. The word bill is obviously used with a number of different meanings. It could be the first name of a former president, the business end of a duck, or what the waiter hands you at the end of a business lunch. Aristotle explained at the beginning of his Categories, a work on which philosophers from late antiquity through the Middle Ages cut their teeth, that words are used equivocally when they are applied with such different meanings. If a word is used on different occasions with the same meaning, I am using that word unifically. Thus, when I apply the word human to Bill Clinton and to Aristotle, I am using it as a unifical term. So why did the medievals worry whether the word being is used equivocally or unifically? Most historians of philosophy will tell you that the problem first emerged in the late 13th century with Thomas Aquinas and Henry of Ghent defending the equivocal theory of being and John Duns Scotus, a unifical understanding. But that's because most historians of philosophy aren't regular listeners to this podcast. By contrast, you, my faithful audience, will know that a controversy over this issue had already emerged in the Islamic world. Muslim philosopher-theologians writing in Arabic anticipated the views we find in Christian philosopher-theologians writing in Latin, like Aquinas, Henry, and Scotus. Some of the clever philosophical moves that most historians take to be inventions of the Latin schoolmen were actually reinventions. Particularly striking are the parallels between the arguments given by the so-called subtle doctor, Duns Scotus, and the no less subtle Fahradin Arazi, who lived about a century earlier. This is no coincidence. Scotus and Fahradin were not reading one another, but they were provoked by the same source, Avicenna. His works were highly influential in Latin and totally dominant in 12th and 13th century Arabic philosophy. And it was Avicenna who first made a distinction that forms the background to both debates over the meaning of being. He contrasted the essence of a thing to that thing's existence. The idea is a pretty plausible one. On the one hand, you have the question of what something is by its very nature. On the other hand, the question of whether it exists. Actually, these two questions are already distinguished by Aristotle. What Avicenna added was the point that essences are almost always neutral with respect to existence. He gave the example of a triangle. You can study the nature or essence of a triangle and learn all sorts of things about it, for instance that its angles add up to 180 degrees, but nothing about the nature of triangle tells you whether it exists or not. So, if a triangle does exist, this must be because some other thing, like a child doing geometry homework, has come along and made it exist. The same point will apply to the child, too, of course. She is a human, and if you think about what it means to be a human, you'll see that humanity guarantees many things, being alive, being rational, being an animal, but not just plain being. So, for the child to exist, she too must be caused to exist. However, Avicenna added, there is one essence that is not like this, the essence of that which necessarily exists. And this necessary existent, of course, is God. He exists through himself by his very nature so that he cannot fail to exist and exists without needing a cause. The essence-existence distinction was taken up eagerly by Muslim theologians and the Christians independently followed suit. Already, William of Auvergne made use of it in the first half of the 13th century, but the most famous example, as usual, is Aquinas. It forms the core idea of his early work On Being and Essence, in Latin De Ente et Essentia. Germans are always disappointed to learn that despite being called De Ente, it is not a treatise about ducks. The background in Avicenna is quite obvious. 
Aquinas cites him on the very first page for the idea that existence and essence are immediate concepts of the mind, not ideas we need to reach through some indirect process of reasoning. He also applies Avicenna's triangle test to demonstrate the difference between essence and existence. I can know what something is without knowing whether there is any such thing. For Aquinas, this shows that there is what those scholastics like to call a real distinction here. In other words, essence is distinct from existence, and not just in the way we think about it. The two are really distinct in things themselves. His follower, Giles of Rome, agreed, and in fact took the point even further than Aquinas probably wanted to go. Giles compared the combination of essence and existence to the relation between the matter and the form of a physical substance. Just as matter is a separate principle that receives form, so essences are distinct in themselves and then receive actual existence. The essence serves to put limits or boundaries on being, whereas in God, being remains infinite and unlimited. What does all this have to do with Bill Clinton's puzzle about the meaning of is? Well, let's consider again how Avicenna's distinction might apply to God. Well, in the divine case, the distinction actually breaks down. The reason God exists through his very essence is that God has no essence apart from his existence. Or we might go so far as to say that he just is being or existence. This at least is how Avicenna saw things. But if this is so, then it looks like God has being of a very different sort than the being we find in, say, Bill Clinton. The existence that is God is not the same as the existence which was given to Bill Clinton when he was created. This forces us to say that there are at least two kinds of existence. On the one hand, we have divine existence, which is necessary and identical to God's very essence. On the other hand, we have created existence, which is contingent and distinct from the essence of the created thing. We can reach the same result without appealing to the unusual case of God. If, like any self-respecting scholastic, you have read your Aristotle, you know he says that being is said in many ways. Aristotle would seem to think that the being of a human is different from the being of a duck. An Aristotelian will also be tempted to think that the independent being of substances, like humans and ducks, is different from the dependent being of accidental properties, like the color of the duck's bill or Bill Clinton's determination to get a bill through Congress. On this basis, Aquinas was led to the conclusion that being is indeed used equivocally. It means one thing when applied to God, another when applied to creatures. On the other hand, he didn't think that this was a case of pure equivocation, like the completely different senses of the word bill. Instead, language is applied to God and to creatures in different yet related ways. Again, this is good Aristotle. He too had said that, though being is said in many ways, it is one of those terms that is applied to one primary case and then some other secondary cases. A classic illustration is the term healthy. Its primary use is when we apply it to a healthy person, but we can also say that food or medicine is healthy because it contributes to the health of the person. Here we are dealing with a particular kind of equivocal use, which is called analogy. Aquinas uses the theory of analogy to explain how various perfections are ascribed to God. Just as healthy is said primarily of the healthy person, so good is applied primarily to God, who is the cause of good and is perfect goodness itself. The same analysis can be given in the case of being. God is not just any old existing thing, but the source of existence for all other things. He is, in fact, being itself. Aquinas' approach has various advantages. Most obviously, it splits the difference between making God too transcendent and not transcendent enough. We don't want all the words we use for created things to be applied to God in a purely equivocal way. If that were the case, these words would have utterly different meanings from the ones they have when used normally, and these meanings would have to remain mysterious, given that we can reach knowledge of God only on the basis of created things. If, on the other hand, we applied terms to God unifically, then we would be putting him on a par with created things. Another bonus is that Aquinas avoids violating divine simplicity. If God is truly simple, then his various traits like goodness and mercy cannot be really distinct from one another, and this could only be the case if we are using the words goodness and mercy rather differently in his case. After all, I can call a created thing good without meaning that that thing is merciful.
If I rejoice, oh man, this almond croissant is good, this has nothing to do with mercy, even if I did say merci to the nice French baker who sold it to me. The identity between God's essence and his existence is another aspect of God's simplicity and a way in which he differs even from other immaterial things, like souls and angels, whose essence is distinct from their existence. Though the analogy theory and the essence-existence distinction make a good pairing, they don't have to come together. In the generation of Scotus, a theologian named Godfrey of Fontaines accepted that we apply language to God analogically, yet he launched a powerful attack against the essence-existence distinction, targeting its formulation by Aquinas and especially Giles of Rome. While Godfrey accepts that we can think about things in terms of their essences, or as existing things, he denies that this is a real distinction in the things themselves. Instead, it is a distinction of the sort we saw when looking at speculative grammar. If I think or speak of a duck's essence or a duck as existing, I am just using two different modes of signifying the same thing. This no more implies a real difference in ducks than it would if I used the adjective beautiful when saying ducks are beautiful and then the noun beauty in saying ducks have a beauty rare even among waterfowl. Besides, the real version of the distinction runs afoul of obvious difficulties. If, as Giles of Rome claimed, essence is something distinct that receives existence the way that matter receives form, then essence would already have to exist before it receives existence, the way that matter may already exist before taking on form. But this is clearly absurd. But what about Avicenna's triangle argument, that we can understand what something is without knowing whether it exists? To this, Godfrey replies, we can only know things when they do in fact exist. We never grasp mysterious, ontologically neutral essences, but real things. We're almost ready now to look at Scotus's solution, but not quite. While Aquinas, Giles, and Godfrey are an important part of the background, there is another author to whom Scotus replies most directly, and this is Henry of Ghent. Henry's position on these matters is similar to that of Aquinas, but with a few twists. Henry, too, thinks that being is applied to God and to creatures by way of analogy. This is connected to the way we come to know God. As we saw in our episode on Henry, he is inspired by Avicenna's proposal that being is a primary concept of the mind. For Henry, this means that all of us have a kind of indistinct awareness or intuition of God who, as the doctrine of analogy would suggest, is nothing other than pure being. Henry also accepts the distinction between essence and existence. But as Godfrey pointed out in his objections to the real version of the distinction, the two only ever come together. Henry admits that there is no such thing as essence without existence, so that the difference between them is weaker than that between two really distinct objects like, say, Bill and Hillary Clinton, who, it is safe to say, have had their differences. Yet neither are essence and existence fully identical. They are, says Henry, intentionally distinct. This is a step in the direction of Scotus's notion of a formal distinction, a kind of middle ground between a real distinction and a distinction that is merely the product of our minds. Indeed, Scotus himself apparently wanted to understand the difference between essence and existence using his idea of a formal distinction. Actually, he doesn't say much about this. Our recent interview guest, Richard Cross, has written that Scotus has not given the issue much sustained attention, and it is not close to the heart of his metaphysical thinking. When he does mention it, though, he seems to see it as a formal distinction, like the difference between the persons of the Trinity. Just as Avicenna said, it is no part of what it means to be a duck that the duck must exist, so we can distinguish between the essence of a duck and its existence. But as Henry said, that doesn't mean that there are duck essences that don't exist. To the contrary, any real essence is always found together with existence. So, even though we can grasp these two aspects of the duck as being different, they are always found together, and are thus only formally, not really, distinct. Something to which Scotus has definitely given sustained attention, and which is very much at the heart of his metaphysical thinking, is the univocity of being. Characteristically, Scotus uses several clever arguments to support his position. One, by his standard relatively straightforward argument, is the following. 
Scotus agrees with Aquinas that natural knowledge of God must be built on our experience of the created world. So, to grasp that God is a being, we need to extend a concept of being that we got from created things and apply it to God. Hence, it must be the same concept, and the term being needs to be used with the same meaning. Another, somewhat more complicated rationale goes like this. We can apply the notion of being to God without realizing that God is infinite, necessary, purely actual, or whatever else makes God's being so different. Plenty of people admit that God exists without understanding that he exists necessarily or is infinite. So, clearly we begin by applying the normal notion of being to him, and then add infinity, necessity, and so on. It is these added features that make God so special. It's not by virtue of just existing or being that he transcends created things. And speaking of transcending, Scotus's claim that being is unifical has a lot to do with a theme we've discussed in previous episodes, the transcendentals. Just by way of reminder, the transcendentals are features that belong to all things, both divine and worldly. These include unity, goodness, truth, and of course, being. Scotus takes this very seriously and assumes that these features do indeed transcend all divisions within reality. Everything is a being, and then it's a further question what kind of being. When we divide being into types, we're actually applying another more complicated transcendental feature. Not everything is finite, nor is everything infinite, but everything is either finite or infinite. The same point goes for necessity and contingency. Everything that exists, exists either necessarily in itself or only contingent upon some cause. These pairs of properties divide being, with God on one side and creation on the other. With this, by the way, Scotus is rejecting Henry's idea that we are obscurely grasping God when we form our immediate idea of being. For Scotus, being is unifical, so our general idea of being applies to everything that is, and is no more appropriate to God than to anything else that exists. Thus, if you want to grasp God, it isn't enough to grasp being. You have to be more specific about what kind of being you have in mind. If you take your idea of being and add a feature, like infinity or necessity, then you're getting somewhere, since God and only God is an infinite being, and only he necessarily exists. We said that Aquinas' analogy theory has several advantages, but the same is true of Scotus' univocity theory. One has to do with the nature of the enterprise we're engaged in here, namely metaphysics. Scotus borrows another idea from Avicenna here, saying that metaphysics is the study of being in general. But every science needs a single object of study. Experts in waterfowl study creatures all of whom are equally, and in the same sense, waterfowl. In the same way, if metaphysics is a properly unified science, the metaphysician needs to be able to study being wherever it turns up, in God or in creatures, in substances or in accidents, and needs to mean the same thing by being in each case. General contrary properties like necessary and contingent or infinite and finite will also fall under this science of metaphysics. This is because jointly, each pair covers everything that has being, and metaphysics is the general study of all beings. The fact that Scotus has borrowed so much from Avicenna does not, of course, detract from Scotus's importance as a thinker. For one thing, he stole from the best. For another, he develops Avicenna's ideas considerably. He puts them at the service of a unifical theory of being that was new in Latin Christendom, even if it had, unbeknownst to Scotus, already been defended in Central Asia by Fakhreddin Arazi. But there is a different problem lurking here. In the Islamic world, Avicenna's strong association between God and necessity had attracted a good deal of criticism. Most were prepared to agree with Avicenna that God must exist through himself because he is the necessary existent, but few were prepared to admit that God is necessary in every respect. Doesn't God enjoy the same sort of freedom we do, or rather a far greater degree of freedom? But then, how is divine freedom compatible with his necessary existence? Reflection on this issue leads Scotus to a radical philosophical breakthrough as he develops a theory of contingency so innovative and influential that it might be called the first modern theory of free will. To find out how he did it, duck out of school or work, and enjoy some free time while listening to the next episode of The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps.
Hi, I'm Peter Adamson, and you're listening to the History of Philosophy podcast, brought to you with the support of the Philosophy Department at King's College London and the LMU in Munich, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, To Will or Not to Will, SCOTUS on Freedom. Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 3. We find the Prince of Denmark doing what he does best, hesitating. He has an apparently perfect opportunity to revenge his father's murder at the hands of his uncle Claudius, having found him alone praying. Hamlet has Claudius at his mercy, but then realizes that killing him now might be too merciful. If he slays Claudius while he prays for forgiveness, then Claudius will go to heaven. Am I then revenged, asked Hamlet, to take him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for his passage? He decides to wait for a better opportunity. And thus, as Hamlet puts it elsewhere, the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. I could hardly have put it better myself. And we've all been there. Well, perhaps not quite in this situation, but we've all been uncertain how to act, or certain how to act, but uncertain whether the time for action has come. At such moments, we feel vividly that we have a genuine power to choose whether or not to act. Hamlet is not like a Greek tragic hero, carried inevitably forward by his own character, the tide of events, and the will of the gods. He is a quintessentially modern tragic hero, blessed, or perhaps cursed, with the power and responsibility to shape the present and the future. He must choose whether it is right to kill or not to kill, and famously, whether to be or not to be. As philosophers nowadays would put it, these choices seem to be characterized by the presence of alternative possibilities. Hamlet can kill Claudius as he prays, or refrain from doing so. Both paths are open to him, and he must choose which one to follow. For some philosophers, we can count ourselves as free only when such alternative possibilities are available. Freedom is not just, for example, doing what you want. If you cannot avoid performing a given action, you are unfree with respect to that action, whether you want to perform the action or not. Of course, the idea that freedom involves open alternatives was not invented by Shakespeare. It has a long history, and can perhaps be traced back ultimately to Aristotle. In his logical work on interpretation, Aristotle points out that if everything were necessary, it would make no sense for us to engage in deliberation. Yet Aristotle also gave philosophers a powerful reason to be suspicious about the idea of genuinely open possibilities. In the same passage, he suggests that whatever is happening right now in the present moment is necessary. If this is right, then at the very moment Hamlet passes up the chance to kill Claudius, his not killing Claudius is necessary. And this makes a certain amount of sense. How could it still be possible for Hamlet to strike, even as he is in the act of withdrawing, saying, up sword, and know thou a more horrid bent? To get to the modern day notion of simultaneous, genuinely open possibilities, we are going to have to make a few subtle distinctions. In particular, we are going to have to turn to a man who specialized in such distinctions, John Duns Scotus. We've already met him engaging in debates over the Trinity and arguing for the univocity of being, but now I'd like to introduce him properly. I'm treating him as the last of the great thinkers of the 13th century, even though his life spanned the 13th and 14th centuries, as did his thought, responding as it did to Henry of Ghent and others, while also setting the agenda for numerous thinkers in the age to come. He was born in Scotland in the 1260s, hence the Scotus part of his name. He wrote many of his works right around the turn of the century, lecturing on Peter Lombard's sentences in Oxford in the year 1300 itself. As you might remember, theologians standardly taught the sentences and used this as an excuse to put forth their own views, something especially true in Scotus's case. He then had two stints at Paris, where he became a master of theology before dying in Cologne in 1308. His works are full of newly coined terminology, brilliant argumentation, novel philosophical notions, and torturously complex reasoning, making them a thrilling, yet challenging read for interpreters, to say nothing of podcasters. His earliest important work, 
consists in those lectures on the sentences given in Oxford. We have a revision of the lectures from his time in Paris, as well as student notes on his Parisian lectures, along with other philosophical and theological works, including a commentary on Aristotle's metaphysics and a treatise on God. More information can be gleaned from other sources, like additional notes produced by Scotus' secretary, William of Alnwick. The upshot is that Scotus has left a wealth of material for us to study, yet this material is often confusing because of layers of revision and the fact that it's sometimes other people who are reporting what he said. We also find a significant evolution in thought, with Scotus changing his mind in characteristically subtle ways as his career goes along. His views on freedom and the will offer a good example. Scotus seems to have changed his mind about the nature of possibility and also the role of our intellect in forming our choices. When he thinks about the relation between intellect and will, Scotus is reacting especially to Henry of Ghent. Henry is regarded as a pioneer of voluntarism. We saw him saying that the intellect has only an advisory capacity with the will serving as the supreme power within the human soul. On this reckoning, it is Hamlet's will alone that determines the choice not to kill Claudius, even if it is taking the advice of Hamlet's intellect that slaying Claudius just when he is at a prayer isn't the best way of exacting revenge. The early Scotus is reluctant to give the will sole responsibility, and makes intellect and will cooperative causes in forming choice but he comes to adopt a more purely voluntaristic view like Henry's, and this is the understanding of human action that we usually associate with Scotus. Like Henry, and unlike Aquinas, the mature Scotus insists that the will is not moved to make its choices by intellect, rather it simply moves itself. With this, he is rejecting a basic tenet of Aristotle, who had argued that self-motion is impossible so that he could trace all motion back to the single ultimate mover that is God. Scotus scornfully dismisses this idea, stating that the impossibility of self-motion is not a first, no, not even a tenth principle. But Scotus still seeks to base his theory on Aristotle, this is scholastic philosophy after all, and is especially persuaded by Aristotle's idea that rational powers are distinguished from natural powers by their capacity to select either of two contraries. The idea here is that a merely natural cause gives rise to only one effect. Fire always heats things up and never cools them down. By contrast, a so-called rational power can do either of two opposed things, as when a jazz fan decides whether to listen to Louis Armstrong and his Hot Five or the Miles Davis album Birth of the Cool. Scotus argues on this basis that only the will is truly rational, because only will can choose from either of two alternatives. The intellect is instead a natural cause, more like fire. It can only form beliefs based on the available evidence. Thus, Hamlet judges that killing Claudius while he prays will allow him to go to heaven. He's wrong about this, by the way. Shakespeare allows us to enjoy the irony of Claudius saying, just after Hamlet departs, that his prayers are ineffective. My words fly up, my thoughts remain below, words without thoughts never to heaven go. Wrong or right, Hamlet's intellect must reach the judgment that seems most compelling. Yet, he is still free to choose however he wills on the basis of this judgment. As Scotus puts it, if the will had no power over the opposite in that very instant, and at the time when it is actually determined to something, then no effect that is being actualized would be contingent. Freedom is not about judging or not judging. To will or not to will, that is the question, as Will Shakespeare didn't quite say. If we are to be capable of this sort of freedom, then we are going to need genuinely open alternatives to choose between. To show how this could be so, Scotus is going to have to produce a definition of possibility that was not dreamt of in Aristotle's philosophy. Before Scotus, it was common to assume that merely possible or contingent things are simply the things that happen sometimes but not always. And fair enough, you might say. It seems right that necessities are always true, while impossibilities are never true. It is eternally the case that 1 plus 1 equals 2, eternally false that 1 plus 1 equals 3. Contingent things, by contrast, might be the case, but don't need to be.
It's possible for me to sit and for me to stand. This is how it can be that you'll occasionally find me standing, though usually you'll find me sitting, since that's the posture I adopt for reading about philosophy. Notice that on this reckoning, genuinely possible things do need to happen at least at some point. If something is never the case, then, according to the traditional Aristotelian view, it must be impossible. Also, as we already said, in this way of thinking, the past and present are no longer contingent. They are necessary, since it is too late to do anything to change them. Scotus explicitly rejects this whole way of thinking. He says, I do not call contingent everything that is not necessary, or not eternal. Instead, I refer to something the opposite of which is possible, even at the very moment it actually exists or occurs. That's actually a pretty straightforward explanation by Scotus's standards, but let's unpack it a bit. Of the traditional conception of contingency, only the future was open. As Hamlet stalks the hallways of Elsinore looking for Claudius, it is still open for him to kill or not. But once he finds Claudius and chooses to spare his life, the die is cast. It's not possible for him to kill Claudius while not killing Claudius. Scotus' breakthrough is to insist that it does remain possible for Hamlet to kill Claudius even as he refrains from doing so. This is because possibility, or contingency, is not defined in terms of what happens or doesn't happen. It's defined in terms of what could happen, whether or not it does in fact happen. That sounds a bit circular, but it isn't, because Scotus has a brilliant way of explaining precisely what we mean when we say that something could be the case even when it isn't. The contingent is just that which implies no contradiction. Scotus puts the point in terms of repugnance. The reason a round square is impossible is that the terms round and square are incompatible with or repugnant to one another. Scotus actually prefers the example of the chimera, a mythical beast made up of parts of a lion, snake, and goat. Since these animal natures in fact exclude one another, the chimera cannot exist. Possible things are possible because they involve no such repugnance or incompatibility. As Avicenna pointed out, neither do such things need to exist. There's nothing about the essence of a lion, a snake, or a goat that guarantees the existence of lions, snakes, or goats. And the same goes in the case of actions like Hamlet's. There is no logical or metaphysical impossibility entailed by killing Claudius at prayer, so it remains possible for Hamlet to do so, even as he is deciding it would be better to catch Claudius later on when he is in a state of sin. This conception of possibility is often held as Scotus's greatest contribution to the history of philosophy, and not without reason, even if, as usual, we have to admit that groundwork was laid by previous thinkers. For Scotus, the most important inspiration here was, yet again, Henry of Ghent. Henry already had the idea that some things that are genuinely possible are never realized. What makes them possible is that they are conceived as possibilities in the mind of God. I don't have a sister, but I could have had one. For Henry, what this means is that God understands that he could have created her. Now, it might seem that there is a big difference between Scotus and his predecessor on this score. Henry argued that things become possible because God thinks about them as things he could create, whereas Scotus says that things are possible in themselves, just by virtue of not involving any repugnance or intrinsic impossibility. But actually, we can find Scotus too talking the way that Henry did. His approach is especially close to Henry's in his early works, but he always seems to retain the idea that possibility is somehow grounded in God's creative power. So is Scotus's position on possibility, like a chimera, stuck together out of incompatible parts? No, and to see why we need to, of course, draw a distinction. Repugnance, or incompatibility, belongs to things by their very nature. Chimeras are intrinsically impossible and lions intrinsically possible. But before lions can be possible in this way, God has first to think of them as something he can create. Thus, we should distinguish between a first moment and second moment in the order of nature. In the first moment, God thinks, here's something I could make, a lion. Something Henry and Scotus describe as the creation of lions in intelligible being. In the second moment, lions are in themselves possible, 
This possibility is not something God needs to bestow on lions, nor does God need to do any extra work to prevent lions from combining with snakes and goats to form chimeras, since chimeras are in themselves impossible. Finally, in a third moment, God actually creates some, but not all, of the things that could possibly be created. The reason there are no round squares or chimeras is that they can't exist. The reason I do exist and my sister doesn't is down to God's choice as a creator. And make no mistake, God does have a choice about what he creates. Scotus' idea of simultaneously open possibilities is meant to apply to God's freedom as much as to ours, if not more so. This is despite the fact that God is a necessary being. Scotus, being Scotus, in fact has a clever and complicated proof of God's necessary existence. I'll avoid the complicated bits and cut straight to the most brilliant part. After a lot of work, Scotus is able to demonstrate to his own satisfaction that there could possibly be a cause for all other things, which is first and therefore uncaused. In other words, he shows that God might exist. From this, Scotus thinks he can immediately infer that God does exist. For just consider, obviously a first cause does not come to exist by being caused to exist by something else. So the only way for such a cause to exist is by being necessarily actual. But we know that there is a way for the cause to exist since we established that it might exist. Therefore, the cause is necessarily actual, so God does in fact exist. As Scotus notes himself, his proof is reminiscent of earlier attempts to demonstrate the existence of God. The move from God's possible existence to his actual existence may remind us of the equally clever, and most people would say equally dubious, move at the center of Anselm's ontological argument. Scotus's proof also recalls Avicenna and his idea of God as a necessarily existing first cause. Unlike Avicenna, though, Scotus thinks that God's actions as a creator are contingent, even if God exists necessarily. It may seem that, with Henry of Ghent's help, Scotus has already shown us how this could be so. God chooses only some possible creatures for actual existence. But as Hamlet might say, not so fast. Even granted that there are a variety of ways for God to make the world, isn't he required to choose the best of those ways? After all, he is perfectly good and benevolent. So, when God considered whether to create lions, he had to consider whether a world with lions is better than a world without lions. Apparently, he decided the answer was yes, though giraffes might beg to differ with this decision. But this is not quite how the medievals typically saw things. Aquinas and Bonaventure denied that it even makes sense to talk about a best of all possible worlds. Any created world is infinitely inferior to God himself, so that no matter what world God creates, there will be an infinite amount of room for improvement. We can say that our actual world is in a sense perfect because it is internally well ordered, but there is no point comparing this world to other worlds that might have entirely different sorts of creatures in it. Scotus likewise focuses on the question of whether things could be better arranged given the natures that actually exist, rather than the question whether a whole different set of natures might be preferable. He says that our world is perfect as it is, but for a different reason, namely that whatever God does is perfect just by definition. God's goodness does not consist in his choosing the best out of available options. Rather, it consists in conferring goodness on whichever option he does choose. To put it another way, if God had decided to arrange things differently, then that different arrangement would be best. This is a rather surprising conclusion. To understand it more fully, we're going to have to turn away from the metaphysical issues that have been concerning us over the past couple of episodes and towards the question of just what Scotus understands by the good. Would he agree with Hamlet that there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so? Doubt thou the stars are fire, doubt that the sun doth move. Doubt truth to be a liar, but never doubt that you should join me for Scotus's ethics. Next time here on the History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. Hi, I'm Peter Adamson, and you're listening to the History of Philosophy podcast, brought to you with the support of the Philosophy Department at King's College London and the LMU in Munich, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, On Command. <laughs>
SCOTUS on Ethics. My parents knew a minister who spent a week living on a few dollars a day to draw attention to the plight of the poor. At church, a member of the parish came up to her and said she had seen a picture of the minister's family having dinner in the paper and was shocked. Why shocked? inquired the minister. The parishioner's response? No matter how poor one is, or is pretending to be, one can still serve one's ketchup from a bowl. You have to admire this sort of unwavering commitment to right and wrong. Some things are just not acceptable under any circumstances. Okay, perhaps serving ketchup out of a bottle is not one of them, but here's a different example. What about killing your own child? I'm glad to say my parents don't have a story about that. There is one in the Bible, though. In chapter 22 of the book of Genesis, we are told how God instructed Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac on a mountaintop. Abraham dutifully obeys and prepares his son upon an altar. But just as he is grasping hold of the knife to do the terrible deed, an angel is sent to tell Abraham to stop. He has passed the test and need not kill his son after all. Despite the happy ending, this passage can easily provoke theological and philosophical perplexity. How can the same God who sent down the Ten Commandments, including Thou shalt not kill, demand that Abraham slay his own son? And if we accept that Abraham was right to obey God, does that show that any action, even the murder of one's own family members, could be righteous in sufficiently extreme circumstances? The mere thought may seem to throw the whole of morality into question. To see how, go have a look at Fear and Trembling by the 19th century Danish thinker Søren Kierkegaard. He uses the case of Abraham and Isaac to show that we may have duties higher than the requirements of ethics. Within the ethical realm, it is wrong to kill one's child, but a divine command can trump ethical considerations. Another way of thinking about it might be that the rule against killing still holds, but not under just any circumstances. Just think back to our discussion of medieval just war theory when we saw the medievals explaining exactly that thou shalt sometimes go ahead and kill after all, and this on supposedly good Christian principles. There is yet another way of thinking about the Abraham case, and it's this third way I want to talk about in today's episode. Instead of thinking of God's commands as extraordinary events that override or change our moral duty, we might see divine commands as the source of all moral obligation. We should do whatever God wants us to do, and because he wants us to do it. While you might not find this a particularly tempting idea, you can probably see why medievals would be attracted to it. We've regularly seen them saying that God is the highest good and source of all good, just as he is the highest being who is the source of all being and highest truth who is the source of all truth. At the very least, medievals would find it plausible that our knowledge of moral duty comes from God, since on the popular illumination theory, our knowledge in general comes from God. So we find Hugh of St. Victor saying that our understanding of good and evil is a kind of command given to the heart of man. Of course, the Bible itself might also encourage this way of thinking. Abraham is praised for his willingness to sacrifice his son if it is the will of God, and all of us are bound by the Ten Commandments given to Moses. Modern day philosophers call this the divine command theory of ethics. According to this theory, God is a kind of legislator of morality whose decrees establish right and wrong. Of course, this means that had God legislated differently, right and wrong would be different. He does not look to some objective set of ethical standards when he tells us what to do, but makes up his own divine mind what he wants us to do. Within a religious framework, this actually makes a lot of sense. It would explain obligations to follow certain dietary laws or to carry out certain rituals in certain ways. One might be able to come up with independent reasons for going on pilgrimage to Mecca, avoiding pork, or remaining chaste outside the bounds of marriage, but it's far simpler for religious believers to say that they do these things because God told them to. Likewise, why not just say that we are to avoid murder and theft because God's commandments forbid them? The downside is that if God commands us to commit murder, as he did with Abraham, then we will have a moral duty to perform an apparently immoral action. 
yesterday's wrong will be today's new right. Even if we suppose that God never actually changes the moral laws, the mere fact that he could do so is already quite troubling. It seems irresistible to think that, in such a case, God would be evil. To see this, just consider how you would react to the Abraham story if God had let him go ahead and kill Isaac. Could you really believe that this was the right thing for Abraham to do? And could you really believe that God was being just rather than cruel and tyrannical? Well, maybe you could if you were Dun Scotus. We can see immediately why he might like the divine command theory. As we saw in the last episode, Scotus is a voluntarist who lays great emphasis on God's untrammeled freedom. Even the natures of things are, for him, ultimately grounded in God's will. Before God creates giraffes, he first grafts their natures and so creates them in intelligible being. So, even when we are doing non-moral reasoning, like when we undertake scientific inquiry into the nature of giraffes, in a sense, we are just exploring the choices made by God. It wouldn't be at all surprising if Scotus thought the same is true of moral reasoning. And this is, indeed, pretty much what he thinks. We do find earlier thinkers, such as Philip the Chancellor, making moves in the direction of ethical voluntarism or divine command theory, but Scotus's new ideas about the contingency of the created order allow him to develop such a theory with unprecedented sophistication. God could have created the world differently, so that there might have been no giraffes, or murder might have been morally acceptable. It's hard to see which of those would be more horrifying. You won't be surprised that Scotus develops this idea by drawing a subtle distinction. If you've lost track of how many such distinctions we've seen Scotus make, I don't blame you. He'd probably tell you that the number depends on exactly how you count distinctions. In this case, he contrasts the absolute and ordained power of God. God's absolute power is his ability to do anything whatsoever that can be done. On Scotus's understanding of possibility, this means that God has the absolute power to do anything that is not repugnant to itself or self-contradictory. We can see immediately why this fits the divine command theory. Since there is no contradiction in, say, allowing sex outside of marriage, God could have allowed it had he chosen to do so. But once God has laid down a natural and moral order, he can continue to act within that order. Because it involves adhering to such an established order, this is called ordained power. So far, it sounds like morality for Scotus would be determined solely by God's choices, with no constraints whatsoever on those choices. But actually, this isn't quite right. For one thing, there is the constraint I just mentioned. God's absolute power doesn't enable him to do or command things that are just incoherent. As we saw last time, God cannot create a chimera, because chimeras are intrinsically impossible, since nothing with the nature of a lion can also have the nature of a snake and a goat. Similarly, Scotus believes that God cannot release us from the responsibility to love him. This is because God is the highest good, and what is good is intrinsically lovable. So a kind of contradiction would be implied if God told us to hate him. This emerges in Scotus's discussion of the Ten Commandments, a key text for his moral theory. He thinks that the commandments of the first table, namely the first four, which regard our duties to God, are just a spelling out of the inevitable requirement to love God. The remaining commandments have to do with our relations to created things, and these are subject to God's will. With this move, Scotus has radically rethought the traditional idea of natural law. Prominently mentioned in Gratian's Decretum, the concept of natural law was expounded by numerous 13th century theologians, including Aquinas. For him, morality is promulgated by being written into our very nature, giving us the ability to use our inborn reason to discern right from wrong. This means that, for Aquinas too, the moral law does stem ultimately from God, but only in the sense that it is God who created us and gave us our human nature and capacity for reasoning. For Scotus, natural law, in the strict sense, includes much less. In fact, it includes only the inevitable requirement to love God, and the further obligations that stem directly from this, such as not worshipping graven images, the third commandment. The rest of the commandments are consonant with this fundamental moral principle, but do depend on God's voluntary decree.
This is why they can be revoked, as when Abraham was suddenly commanded to kill instead of not killing. Here we come to another constraint on what God can command. We may be able to accept that he can change the rules and tell Abraham to sacrifice his son, but surely God cannot command Abraham both to kill and not to kill. That would be another case of incoherence or self-contradiction. The same applies to the moral order more generally. The laws must be coherent. Indeed, that's why they merit the name of an order. This could help Scotus respond to an obvious complaint against his ethical voluntarism. If God just freely decides what is good and what is bad, then there will be no point at all in moral reasoning. All we could do is consult scripture and follow the rules. But if the moral order is consistent and coherent, as Scotus insists, then there is a place for such reasoning after all. Once God has laid down the contingent order that prevails in our world, it is possible for us to study that order and understand our place within it. This is an eminently rational enterprise, and again, it is not unlike what we do in natural science, where we use reason to understand the created world that God chose to bring into existence. Nonetheless, Scotus is departing radically from the sort of ethical doctrine we find in Aquinas, and above all, in Aristotle. For Aristotle, human nature is the foundation of ethics. To be a good person is to be an excellent human, which means making excellent use of reason, the distinctively human faculty. The habit of excellent reasoning that gives rise to excellent action is called virtue. For an Aristotelian, virtue is like a second nature, an acquired disposition to do the right thing in each circumstance. Thus, a person who has the virtue of generosity will, upon seeing someone in need, judge that they are to be helped and perform a generous act, perhaps by giving them money or recommending a good podcast. Moreover, someone who really has this virtue is going to have other virtues as well, like courage, temperance, and wisdom. All the virtues are bound together by a capacity for good practical reasoning, which Aristotle calls phronesis and the medievals called prudentia or prudence. Last but not least, for Aristotle, having and exercising the virtues is what makes humans happy, the end towards which his entire ethics is directed. The ultimate end of happiness moves us to act as we pursue the most excellent and blessed life possible. Scotus modifies or rejects every aspect of this Aristotelian picture. For starters, human nature cannot be the ultimate ground of ethics because human nature itself is contingently created by God. Furthermore, while Scotus agrees that virtue is the disposition to choose well, he denies that virtue explains morally good choice. This is because virtue always points the way towards the good. In this sense, virtue is not a properly rational cause, which has the ability to pick between different alternatives, but like a natural cause such as fire, which always gives rise to heat. If choice is involved, then we need more than virtue, we need the will. Even if you have the virtue of easily and consistently discerning the right thing to do, your will must still make the right choice on each occasion. And of course, good actions are not good because they proceed from virtuous dispositions, as an Aristotelian might think, or because they conform to the ends of human nature. A good action is good because God commanded it. Scotus is no more satisfied with the Aristotelian story when it comes to prudence than the unity of the virtues. He thinks it's obvious that you can have some virtues and lack others. For one thing, you might find yourself in a situation where you cannot practice or exercise virtue in a certain sphere. A person who grows up stranded on a desert island might be resourceful, moderate, and wise, but is not going to have much chance to work on generosity or sociability. And in any case, the will's inviolable power to choose well or badly on each occasion means that there is no guarantee that tending to choose well in one sphere will mean doing so in another. For the same reason, Scotus cannot accept the notion that good practical reasoning or prudence will guarantee good action. For prudence belongs to the intellect, not the will. Someone might understand perfectly well that they should not commit adultery, but go ahead and do it anyway. A final, in every sense of the word, disagreement with the Aristotelians concerns the question of happiness.
we saw that Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas, seeking to hold on to as much of Aristotle's ethical teachings as they could, distinguished two types or levels of happiness. We can attain a degree of happiness in this life through virtuous activity, with a higher happiness secured through a vision of God in the afterlife. In both cases, the final end of happiness moves us to engage in practical action or to pursue understanding. Scotus thinks this is wrong. Obviously, we are not moved by any end to choose that end, not even by God. For Scotus, the will is a self-mover, since otherwise our willing would be constrained and unfree. Besides, no human activity can secure happiness, since we can be happy only through the greatest of goods which is God. Though it may be reasonable to pursue created goods in this life, we cannot be satisfied with them, nor should we forget that, as Scotus puts it, everything other than God is good because it is willed by God and not vice versa. This God-centered moral theory may sound like a reassertion of Augustine against Aristotle. It certainly banishes any prospect that we might naturally attain or merit happiness and salvation, and in that respect Scotus is on the same page as Augustine. But Scotus disagrees with Augustine on a different point. Having demoted natural virtue so far, he sees no problem with the idea that we can in fact be naturally virtuous without the help of God, something Augustine denied. For similar reasons, he has no use for Aquinas' idea that there are divinely infused as well as natural virtues. All of this may seem to leave a gap in Scotus' moral theory, and you know how I feel about gaps. If virtue doesn't, as it were, spontaneously give rise to good action, then how and why do we act rightly? Of course, part of the answer is that we choose to do so through the will, but on what basis? Is it just random luck? Here, Scotus looks back to an early medieval predecessor, namely Anselm. He likes Anselm's idea that we have two kinds of motivation, which often come into conflict with one another. On the one hand, we want what is useful to ourselves. On the other, we have an inclination towards justice that remains intact even in our state of original sin. As we saw, prudence doesn't guarantee that we will choose justice over our own advantage, but it has an important role to play nonetheless in helping us to see which actions are and are not just. When you deliberate about the right thing to do, you are engaging in this kind of reasoning, and thanks to your inborn affection for justice, you have a motivation to choose in accordance with the advice that results, even if the freedom of your will means that there is no guarantee you will do so. One lesson to draw from all this might be that morality really has to do only with the choices made by the will. If you choose in accordance with the moral law laid down by God, then you have acted rightly. The action that results from the choice would really be only a byproduct with the moral value residing solely with the choice. This is the view that was taken in the 12th century by Peter Abelard, who taught that actions in themselves are neither good nor bad. What is good or bad is the intention to perform an action, as shown by the fact that one and the same action could be performed out of a good intention or a bad one. I might donate money to charity to help others or to impress my friends. While Scotus's voluntarism might seem to fit nicely with Abelard's idea, he doesn't go as far as he might have in this direction. For that, we have to wait for William of Ockham, who also enthusiastically embraces voluntarism and does say that morality concerns only the interior act of the soul, which gives rise to an outward physical action. So, for example, Ockham will say that God rewards and punishes people for their interior choices and not for what they actually do. Scotus takes a more moderate view. He certainly agrees that interior choices can be morally good or bad, but following other Franciscan thinkers like Bonaventure and Richard of Middleton, he also emphasizes that the outward act acquires a moral character of its own by flowing from a good or bad choice. This helps him explain something else about the biblical commandments. If you look over the list, it won't take long, there are only 10 of them, you might notice that we are instructed not to covet another person's spouse and also not to commit adultery. On a view like Abelard's or Occam's, this might seem redundant. The problem is the coveting, not the adulterous act to which the coveting leads. For Scotus, though, the exterior act of adultery has a wrongness of its own, despite being caused by an act of will that is already wrong in and of itself.
The name of Peter Abelard happily gives us a nice transition to the next topic I've chosen to tackle from among the many subtleties of SCOTUS. If you do remember Abelard, you will probably recall three things about him. The moral theory I just mentioned, his nominalist stance regarding universals, and the fact that he regretfully separated from Heloise after being forcibly separated from an intimate part of himself. The good news for Scotus is that it's not the last of these that will be relevant next time. Instead, I want to look at how Scotus dealt with the issue of universals. This will help set up the return to nominalism we'll see in 14th century figures who reacted against the qualified realism of Scotus's metaphysics. So here is something you shouldn't do under any circumstances. Miss the next episode of The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. Hi, I'm Peter Adamson, and you're listening to the History of Philosophy podcast, brought to you with the support of the Philosophy Department at King's College London and the LMU in Munich online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, One in a Million, SCOTUS on Universals and Individuals. Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. This charming traditional poem may be suitable for a declaration of love between seven-year-olds, yet upon closer inspection, it proves to be rather perplexing. For one thing, surely violets are violet, not blue. For another thing, what exactly does it mean to say that all roses are red? The poem doesn't say that this or that rose is red, but that all roses are red. Actually, of course, it's also not true that all roses are red. The author of this poem clearly wasn't much of a gardener. But let's leave that aside and focus on making philosophical rather than botanical sense of the remark. It takes us back to a set of puzzles we met in the 12th century when Peter Abelard and his rivals disputed the question of universals. Abelard was a nominalist. In other words, he held that there is no real universal nature that belongs to all roses and is responsible for there being roses. Nor is there any universal nature of redness that belongs to all red things. For Abelard, all real things are individuals, and when we call a given individual red or rose, we are simply applying general names that apply in virtue of the similarity between things. It's because this individual flower is like that one that we do not call this rose by any other name, regardless of whether it would smell as sweet. Opponents of Abelard, like William of Champeau, were realists, meaning that they took the universal nature of roses to be something real that is present in each and every single rose, and likewise for redness in each red thing. If you think about it, there's actually another puzzle lurking here too. It's really a remarkably complex poem. I have in mind the problem of individuation. Again, this is a difficulty we encountered in the 12th century, in the work of Gilbert of Poitiers, who wondered what makes each thing an individual. Though we treated these two philosophical issues separately in the earlier episodes, they obviously make a good pair. The problem of universals is about what things in a given class have in common with one another, what makes all roses, roses. The problem of individuation is what makes a member of a given class different from the other members of that class. What makes the rose in my lapel to be a unique rose distinct from all the other roses in the world? These problems were certainly discussed by earlier 13th century thinkers like Aquinas, but in this episode I want to look at how Scotus, our final thinker of the century, rose to the challenge of solving both puzzles, and in so doing set the terms of the later debate. Let's start with Abelard's central idea, the one that really led him to his nominalist position, namely that everything that is, is one individual. On the face of it, this looks plausible, or even obvious. How can a thing exist without being just the one thing that it is? In fact, cast your mind back to one more previous medieval discussion about the doctrine of transcendentals. According to that doctrine, everything that has being also has unity, or to put it another way, everything that is, is one. But we're already several minutes into a podcast episode on Scotus, so it's well past time for a subtle distinction. Scotus agrees with Abelard that all real things are one, and thus preserves the idea that unity is a transcendental, that is, a feature of all things with a scope equal to that of being. But he denies that whatever is one is an individual, 
His way of putting it uses traditional Aristotelian language to express a novel idea. He says that there is a kind of unity that is less than numerical unity. This lesser kind of unity is the kind possessed by common natures, shared among multiple things, as all roses share the nature of being a rose. Since common natures have a degree of unity, they also have a degree of reality or being. So, it would be tempting to label Scotus as a realist within the debate over universals. He is, after all, saying that shared natures are real. But just as every rose has its thorn, there is a sting in every tale told by Scotus. He strenuously denies that universals exist in external reality. For him, universality is a feature of our mental life. We have a general or universal understanding of roses that we abstract from all our encounters with particular roses, but there's no such thing as a universal nature of rose that exists by itself out there in the world. That, at least on his understanding, is what would be claimed by the Platonic theory of forms, a theory Scotus thinks is obviously false. To say that there is a platonic form of rose would be like saying that the very nature of roses is itself a separate individual, which is not just false, but in fact rather silly. Nor is the nature of the rose a full-blown individual thing that is a part of each individual rose, like an individual person might be part of the crowd at a botanical garden. So, when Scotus asserts that the common nature of roses is real, he sees himself as offering a moderate view between realism about universals and the sort of position adopted by Abelard, which ascribes no reality to common natures at all. Against the nominalists, he claims that common natures are real. Against realists, he claims that common natures are not in themselves universal, and that they have a lesser degree of unity and reality than that possessed by more familiar things like particular roses, which are individuals. Needless to say, Scotus has clever arguments for all this. It's easy for him to show that the common nature is not a full-blown individual. If that were the case, then the nature of roses would be numerically only one thing. The result would be that there could only ever be one rose, a result whose absurdity will be evident to anyone other than saint Exupéry's character, the Little Prince. It's more difficult to show that common natures are not only in the mind, where they are grasped universally, but also out there in the real world. Well, it would be difficult for most people, but this is Scotus, and he's able to produce several arguments to prove the reality of shared natures. For one thing, we need them to account for causation. In most cases, we see that causes pass on some kind of shared nature to their effects. Humans generate humans, sugar makes things sweet, and maybe roses germinate further roses, though I'm not much of a gardener either, so I wouldn't swear to it. For another thing, and more importantly, we do grasp things out there in the world by subsuming them under general concepts. This doesn't mean that there is anything universal out there, like there is in the mind, but our universal notion of roses must be latching on to a common nature that is somehow actually in all roses. Otherwise, universal concepts like rose or flower, which are examples of the species and genera so beloved of medieval logicians, would be pure fictions. Scotus thus signals his agreement with Avicenna, who stated that, hoarseness is just hoarseness. What this means, at least on Scotus's understanding, is that one and the same common nature appears in both particular horses and in the universal idea of horse. The nature is neither universal nor particular in itself. We make it universal by thinking about it, as when we make a universal judgment, such as horses like eating roses. The nature can also be part of a real individual in the world, and it's this that justifies such general judgments. When I think that horses enjoy a nice rose now and again, I'm thinking about all the individual things that share the nature of hoarseness. This is, of course, just to say that I'm thinking about all the individual horses. Notice, though, that just as hoarseness doesn't care whether it appears in a universal thought or in a particular horse, so it doesn't care which particular horses it belongs to. As Scotus puts it, it is accidental to hoarseness that it belong to exactly the horses that exist now, or to all the horses that ever have or will exist. And this makes sense. Suppose God had decided not to create secretariat, 
so that that particular horse never existed. This would make a big difference to the history of horse racing, but no difference at all to the nature of horses. So that's SCOTUS's explanation of how horses are horses, roses are roses, and nominalists and Platonists are both wrong. But we still have our second problem of how individual horses and roses are individuals. In fact, Scotus's story might even seem to make this problem worse, because he's insisting that the nature of roseness or horseness in an individual rose or horse is not in itself individual. Remember, that nature in itself has less than numerical unity, it remains common or shared even when it is part of a given individual. Evidently, then, it is nothing about the nature of roses that makes this rose the particular rose that it is. No surprise there, Scotus would say. Again, if the very nature of rose were responsible for individuality, there could only ever be one individual rose. Clearly, then, we're going to need a different explanation of how things become individuals. In fact, there were several explanations available to Scotus being defended by various contemporaries. We've already met one of them in the context of the 1277 condemnations. As you might recall, there was a kerfuffle over the question of how angels become individuated. This posed a problem for Thomas Aquinas, because he thought that things of the same kind are individuated by matter. That is, one rose is distinct from another rose because it is made of different material stuff. Since angels have no matter, Aquinas was forced to conclude that each angel is unique in its species. Even God cannot make two distinct immaterial things of the same kind. It's in the context of this very same question about angels that Scotus takes up the problem of individuation in his early lectura. In typical scholastic fashion, he considers a series of proposals about how individuation occurs and refutes each of them. The explanation in terms of matter was also the topic of a debate between Scotus and a follower of Aquinas named William Peter Godinus. Scotus makes several rather convincing points against the theory. For starters, matter is supposedly that which survives when something is destroyed. When a rose dies, its lifeless corpse might be put into the compost, which is then used to grow another bed of roses. In this scenario, a given bit of matter might belong first to one rose and then another rose, and obviously one and the same matter can't be responsible for distinguishing one rose from another. Also, even if we granted that matter makes the rose individual, then we could still ask, what makes the matter individual? Matter doesn't, after all, seem to be just intrinsically something individual, given that all sorts of different things are made of it. So, in order to use Aquinas' explanation, we actually need a further explanation of how this matter that constitutes this rose became this bit of matter rather than some other bit. As I say, this is only one of the theories Scotus wants to uproot. Another was put forth by Henry of Ghent. He had the rather curious idea that individuation can be explained negatively, or rather by a double negation. What makes something an individual, said Henry, is that it is not identical with other members of the same species, and that it is not divided into further individuals. In other words, are roses distinct from other roses, and that things that make it up are parts, not whole entities? Scotus gives this answer a short shrift. We don't want to hear what individuals are not, but how they are what they are. We want a positive account of individuation, and in this case, two negatives don't make a positive. I think Scotus is right to criticize Henry here, or at least to criticize Henry as Scotus is understanding him. The fact that one rose is not identical to another is precisely what needs to be explained, it's not the explanation. So far, though, Scotus has himself only told us two ways not to explain individuation, we're still waiting for the right answer. To get our heads around that right answer, it might help to go back to what we were just saying about matter. If a thing is individuated by its matter, Scotus complained, then that matter would itself need to be individuated by something else. This kind of problem bedevils many attempts to explain individuality, as we saw in that episode on Gilbert of Poitiers. If a thing is individuated by its place, say, or by its accidents, then what individuates the place or the accidents? 
What we need is a principle of individuation that is, unlike matter or the common nature, itself individual. We need a nature that is singular rather than common, that belongs to only one thing and can belong only to that thing. In the history of philosophy, such a singular nature is usually called a hexaity, from the Latin word hec, meaning this. Basically, the word means thisness. It's still used routinely by metaphysicians today, so that this concept constitutes one of Scotus's most prominent and long-lasting contributions to later philosophy. Actually, he has loads of such contributions, but this one is more obvious than most. Scotus hardly ever uses the Latin word hexaitas himself, though it was enthusiastically bandied about by his followers. He prefers such phrases as form of the individual, lowest level form, or difference of the individual. That last expression is particularly illuminating because Scotus explains the singular nature by drawing an analogy to the difference that picks out one species from another species in the same genus. If we have a large class or genus, like flowers, then the specific difference of roses will be whatever distinguishes roses from other flowers. Perhaps that roses are the only flower that have thorns. Of course, this isn't true, and apparently botanists insist that those sharp things on roses should in fact be called prickles. So much for every rose having its thorn. But as I told you, I'm not much on botany. I refer you instead to Albert the Great. Anyway, let's suppose for the sake of argument that the species of rose is distinguished from all other flowers by having thorns. In just the same way, according to Scotus, secretariat is distinguished from other members of the species of horse by secretariat's singular essence or hexaity. The upshot is that individuals are made up of two aspects or parts. First, each thing has its common nature, which makes it like other things. Second, it has its singular essence, which makes it be a specific individual. Secretariat is thus made up of both hoarseness and secretariatness. So in a way, Scotus agrees with that assumption that drove Abelard to his nominalism, that everything that exists is individual. Officially, Scotus of course denies that everything real is an individual, since common natures are real. But common natures don't just hang around on their own, as the Platonist claims. They are only ever found conjoined to, or contracted by, the hexaities that make things individual, or when we universalize the common natures in our minds. To put it another way, full-blown reality always involves numerical unity, that is, individuality. Indeed, the two natures in each thing, one common and one singular, are said to be only formally distinct in the latest deployment of what may be Scotus's favorite distinction, though this, like Secretariat's Triple Crown, is a title for which there was plenty of competition. While all of this is clearly quite clever, it is also rather unsatisfying. Doesn't Scotus's solution boil down to saying that what makes me individual is just whatever makes me individual? It's hardly helpful to say that I am Peter Adamson thanks to my Peter Adamson-ness. The analogy to this specific difference is a bit more illuminating, but it doesn't really help me envision what that feature could be that makes me the individual I am, distinct from other humans, the way that thorns might make rose the species it is, distinct from other flowers. There's a good reason for this, though. Scotus thinks that in our current embodied life, the singular essence is not something we can grasp. God can understand hexaities, but in this life at least, humans cannot do the same, something Scotus blames either on original sin or our dependence on sensation. This turns out to be helpful for Scotus in wriggling out of an exegetical embarrassment. Aristotle says quite clearly that individuals have no essences, whereas Scotus is insisting that they do. He avoids outright contradiction with Aristotle by saying that, when Aristotle denied that there are individual essences, he just meant that there are no such essences that we can know. This interpretive move is, I have to say, about as lame as a one-legged horse. On the bright side, though, Scotus has achieved resounding agreement with Aristotle on a different point. In Aristotle's theory of knowledge, scientific understanding is said to involve universal judgments. Scotus can now explain why. It's because singular essences are unknowable for us, even though they are real. 
we infer their reality only by an indirect argument, on the basis that if there were no hexaities, nothing could be an individual, something the Scotus scholar Peter King has compared to postulating the existence of an unseen planet on the basis of its effects on other heavenly bodies. But no sooner has Scotus ratified the traditional Aristotelian doctrine that science must be universal than he characteristically makes yet another departure from Aristotle. Just as characteristically, it takes the form of a distinction. The sort of understanding involved in Aristotelian science is universal and abstractive cognition. But there's another kind of cognition available to the intellect, and Scotus calls it intuitive cognition. This is a little bit misleading for the modern reader. We typically use the word intuition to mean something like instinctive or inspired insight, as in the tacitly sexist phrase, women's intuition. This is not what Scotus means by it. Instead, he means something like direct acquaintance with a thing, as opposed to the sort of cognition involved when you make a judgment about that thing or use general concepts abstracted from sense experience. Obviously, it is the latter abstractive sort of cognition that is involved in Aristotelian science and analyzed in medieval logic. And this is the kind of activity that medievals usually took to be characteristic of the human mind. The intellect grasps roses universally by means of a general, abstracted concept of roses. But Scotus insists that the intellect is also capable of simply grasping an individual object, simply because it is present to us in existence. Actually, insists is a bit strong. He does make the claim forcefully in some passages, but in other places he says that intuitive cognition is impossible for us in this life, just like understanding of hexaites. Still, when he speaks in favor of the idea, he gives compelling arguments and examples. For one thing, clearly sensation is able to engage in intuitive cognition. Seeing or smelling a rose would be a paradigm case for this kind of intuition. The particular rose simply presents itself to sensation. But intellect is better than sensation, so how can it be incapable of something that sense perception does all the time? Also, if we assume that the intellect can grasp individuals intuitively, this explains how it is able to apply its universal ideas to particulars. In order to judge that Secretariat is a horse, and therefore likes eating roses, the intellect had better be able to grasp Secretariat somehow. Also, there is the phenomenon of self-awareness, which we discussed some episodes back in an interview with Therese Corey. In this case, too, the intellect is having an intuition, since it is grasping itself as present to itself, not using some kind of abstract concept of itself. 14th century thinkers like Occam are going to use this idea of intuitive cognition, too, and with less hesitation than Scotus. This exemplifies his far-reaching influence. You might have noticed that I have devoted a lot of attention to Scotus. This is in part because he's just so brilliant, but also because he brilliantly sets the stage for 14th century philosophy. Many of the main themes we'll be looking at in episodes to come, especially the ones on scholastic thinkers, revolve around Scotus's ideas. His voluntarism in psychology and ethics, and his realism about common natures both provoked vigorous debates, as did such technical moves as his formal distinction and the contrast between absolute and ordained power. Since Scotus was a Franciscan, his ideas were especially influential among thinkers of this order, even if they were not always accepted. We'll see a fine example of this when we get to his fellow Franciscan, William of Ockham, himself one of the rare, prominent thinkers in an unjustly ignored period of philosophy, the 14th century.